Hi, can you say Judy and Charlie? Sure. Do you have a message, Trish? No, thank you. Good, mate. Have a squeeze of that for me. It's from BMW. Oh, okay, mate. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think the colors are working really well on that new display, don't you? Absolutely. They're really coming together well. Hello. Can you spare me about spare? Sure. Thank you. 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 Thank For me? There is. Change to powerhouse. Oh, okay. Can you take that? Yeah, okay. Rose, this is a new design for fish plate. It's nice to see it say blue and white. I love to paint. I love the materials of painting. I love to look around the studio and, and, and see the crayons or see the brushes. I, I mean, I love the, the, the feeling of new tubes of paint. I love the colour chart. So I love, I've always loved all the things that go with the physical act of painting. I just love to paint. I mean, I paint all the time. I don't necessarily start with any preconceived notion of how it will be. Um, my painting, I suppose, is really just a reflection of the way that I see things. Some people feel that the works have a nice sort of spontaneous feel about them, but the truth of the matter is, I mean, I'm 54. I've been painting for, uh, you know, for 45 years to try and get that kind of feeling about it. Fine, thanks, mate. Nice to see you dressed for lunch. Yeah, thanks. I've just almost finished and I'll be with you. Yeah, I'm working on the concept that, <clears throat> I don't know, you look at an Australian beach, you always, or for me anyway, you have the feeling of the Aboriginals would have been there at some time, or you look at the harbour, and even when you see the little sparkles on the harbour, in some ways it sort of looks like, like the dots sometimes that you see in Aboriginal dot painting. So I'm really trying to put those two kind of thoughts together. You know? I have heard people say that Ken is the archetypical Australian painter. I, I'm not sure that that's true. Uh, you know, I think that Nolan could very much be represented as an archetypical Australian painter. I think that Brett Whiteley could be. There are all sorts of Australian painters. I think, however, he has brought a contemporary Australian thing into life. He hasn't painted history. He hasn't painted, if you like, the Australianness of Australia. He's painted the light and he's painted the landscape. I, I love the idea of the, the dream time, the, the concept of imposing a past Aboriginality onto what would be a, a, a very modern structure, lovely. Well, I've, I've, I mean, I have some, done some work in this area before, and I think it's, I mean, I like to do it to pay respect, in a way, to Aboriginal design and Aboriginal feeling and trying to make these two things, things work together. A lot of people, uh, in trying to identify the typical Australian, uh, look to the interior, to the desert and so on. We sort of, the old image of the tall man riding the tall horse across the desert. But in fact, most of us live right on the edge, right on the edge of Australia, right on the, 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 the part that sort of separates the, the land and the sea. It's this edge, very much of it, beautiful beach, coastline. This has been an enormous part of Ken's focus as, as a fine artist. The beach, in the way, it's like having your own... It's like having a series of models come at any particular point in time. I mean, sometimes uh, I'll be working on a painting, I'll see a group of people coming down, I'll see somebody taking their clothes off, I'll make a quick drawing of that. And very sensual things happen on the beach, both the sensuality of men and the sensuality of women. I mean, or the, the relationship of these two things. And sometimes I like to make paintings that are not so much tight drawings of these but but just 
you see these things coming together or a little a piece of a body, a piece of a towel, a little pair of shoes, all of these things, these little jewels of colour on the beach. I, I, I think it's great, fabulous. <laughs> Sometimes I like to paint quite domestic things. I like to paint lunch or people in a family situation doing things. Now, these things sometimes are thought of as kind of classically French things in a way. And of course, in this particular environment, it's not dissimilar to the south of France or the Mediterranean. It has some of those aspects. I think I'll ring Dick in Cyprus this afternoon because we've got to start to organize in June, whether we go to Turkey or not. Fun. I'm just gonna knock off a quick drawing of this. It was always natural for me to make drawings to describe what I'd done. So I suppose in some ways you could say that everything I do is like a visual diary of what my life's about. We are a tight-knit family. Judy and I have been married now for 30 years and, uh, you know, we have a terrific relationship and, and very stimulating one. And look, as far as anything that Judy and I have ever done together, nothing uh, comes close to Camilla and Oscar. The myth, and I think it is a myth, of the artist being somehow the maverick to society, the drug addict, the alcoholic. I mean, clearly some artists have been that and, and they've been tragic, tragic lives. But there's, just, there's been just as many artists who in fact have led comparatively normal lives and the, the strength and the structure of that kind of environment has allowed them, I think, to do, to do their work. Um, it's not to say that there's not always struggle it's fantastic struggle. It's got nothing to do with how much money you've got. The struggle comes from the desire to be really good at it. So the struggle and the angst and the heartaches and the disappointments and the frustrations and the rages, they're all there. But it doesn't mean to say that you go home and kick the dog or your wife or your kids. sketch or draw all the time, whether I'm at home or whether I'm at the office or on aeroplanes or wherever it may be. I mean, sketching or drawing is just an absolutely integral part of painting. And it's really the act of understanding something. I mean, it might be complete within itself that you'll make a little drawing that might be very tiny, have very simple little lines in it, but has a completeness about it. Other times it's to understand something, to look at the fish, to understand the shapes on it or the patterns on it or something like that. And often they are preparatory works for larger paintings. I think in, in colour most of the time, although colour needs some kind of linear definition. So if you're looking at a fish uh, and you're just drawing it, for instance, in black and white, really through that drawing, hopefully you're understanding the genuine shape of the fish. I mean, often my drawings are more realistic than the paintings because that's a process that I like to go through as well.
never really take the, the drawing and sort of scale it up to size. I think that you have to consider each work as an individual piece. But the idea, one hopes, that the, the initial feeling, the initial impact that you had of seeing that particular thing, whether it's the fish or the relationships of things around it or someone's face, you want to really try and hold that. And eventually, when you develop it into a painting, when it becomes a much more complex thing, usually the bones of those particular drawings still can be seen or felt within the work itself. Sometimes I make paintings that their very existence or their reason for being is to be beautiful, or as beautiful as I can make them or as decorative as I can make them, or as joyous as I can make them. And I seek for no other deeper intellectual uh, attitude to them other than that. Ken Bird is one of the first artists to sense that there's a real need in people for art. That art isn't something that you go and worship at the altar of, or you go to a museum to see. That art is a part of our, our life. And, and he took, in a sense, he took art to the people. And he said, look, instead of thinking conventionally that art is something that's framed on a wall and, and, and you've got to be awestruck and look at it and ooh and ah, you can be a part of art. You can be a part of the environment of art. Art is everything. It's around you. It's the things you see. And so, in a sense, he opened our eyes to the ordinary. I think that's what Ken's done. Some people say to me sometimes, oh, you know, we love your colours. Well, I'm, I'm always flattered by that, but they're not my colours. They're everybody's colours. I mean, there only are, are a certain amount of colours. I mean, I'm sure they get into hues and values and things, but essentially, there's, you know, about as many key colours as there are notes on a piano. So it's obviously got something to do with the relationship of one to the other. If I put down, for instance, a piece of um, ultramarine blue, to really make you feel something for that ultramarine blue, I really need to put some yellow beside it. I need to put something that intensifies the, the blue, tells you something about the relationship between those two things. And then maybe, again, if you think about fish, a little orange fish. So you're really playing a little game with those colours, making them sing, making them dance, making them joyous. All human beings uh, can be thrilled by colour. And I think whether people have a deep and complex understanding about art or not doesn't really matter. You can't love colour as much as I do without really responding to Matisse. I mean, he was really one of the greatest, maybe the greatest colourist of this particular century. And therefore, it leads you to Bonnard and to Dufay and people like that. But I think you can actually go back even further than that. I mean, you can go back to uh, Indian miniatures, Persian carpets, Moroccan things. All of that great bag of sort of visual joy that, that certain painters have responded to. When I make references to other people's work within my painting, sometimes it might be the really straightforward act of trying to learn how they made that picture. I remember once sitting down and I was looking at a book on Matisse and I was having a hamburger for lunch and I actually was listening to a radio that was in the shape of a hamburger. Now what I realised, if I painted that entire scene, including the Matisse book with the images that were there, and I wrote on the bottom all of the things that he'd written about that, it's like your homework. The great thing about Ken's painting, as I observe it, is that he's improved enormously, I think, over the last few years. And it's interesting to watch the movement in his art. I mean, it, it's moving all the time. And his use of quotations from other artists has also moved and changed. You couldn't really say that he was simply being derivative. He quotes now in a really significant way, a way that has meaning, and a way that also has wit, charm and humour. And he reveals the quotation so that uh, there's nothing sneaky about it. <laughs> If you made a drink from the herbs of four continents, macerated in pure grape spirit in oaken casks, and if you made it gloriously pink and yet cryptically bitter, and served it with ice and a buoyant swoosh of soda, and if you called that drink 
Campari. We'd sue you. One of the great things for me, one of the really big pieces of education, was in fact the time I spent in advertising when I was in London and New York and Japan. And during that time, I was exposed to some of the, you know, the best illustrators in the world. Japanese illustration, French illustration, Russian posters, uh, American graphics. I mean, people like uh, Saul Steinberg, uh, just wonderful artist, wonderful line. And people who sometimes uh, dismiss that part of my career as somehow saying, oh, yes, Lou was just in advertising for a while, have got no idea of how stimulating those things were and how many things you learned from that. When, when, when Ken and I were, were, were young uh, writers and artists, if you like, there wasn't a place in, in, in the Australian structure for the artist and the writer. I mean, there was the odd writer struggling in a garret somewhere and there was the odd painter painting. But people like Brett Whiteley, people like... They all had to go somewhere and there was this commercial outlet which was called advertising. It was just beginning. It, it, it offered a place for the artist, it offered a place for the young writer and it also offered a living. And so it became a haven for a lot of artists and a lot of writers. And these people are emerging now into our structure and our society and doing exceedingly well as fine artists and writers. We have been trained simply in a workshop that happens to be called advertising. It's no more or less than that. It's a very good workshop. It's an excellent one. I went to art school when I was very young. I'm eternally grateful that my father and mother had the courage to allow me to leave school when I was 14 and a half to start art school. And the four and a half or five years that I spent there were, were wonderful and I learnt a lot of reasonably disciplined things. There was life drawing and perspective and composition and all of those kind of rules that I think you need to know before you break them anyway. And I think for a person who has a desire to be involved in something like art or music, the earlier you start that kind of education, the better. He's always wanted to draw and paint. When he was a little boy, coming home from school, to explain to me where he'd been or party that he'd been to, well, he would draw. He'd draw the presents and the balloons and the table and where people sat. And he was constantly scribbling all the time. So we knew that he had something in him that had to be brought out. Yes, Mum's been terrifically supportive and, and fiercely so sometimes. I mean, uh, if anybody knocks off any of the things that we do, I mean, we can either, you know, take court action or I can send my mother around to give him a hard time. More buildings, but uh, still a lovely, lovely, lovely shot place, yes. lovely trees. We are very proud of him, and, uh, very proud of him. Like this piece over here, we're, I mean, they'll never build on that. No, never. I knew so that whatever he was going to do, he'd make a success. I'm always talking about his success to people and Kendall will say, oh, God, Mum, don't tell them that, you know. I'll say, oh, he did this or he did this or he got that. Don't say that, Mum, don't tell them. So yeah, I will tell them, I'm proud of you, and that's that. Very popular face. I like it the way in these little yachts go out there. If Ken had been an American, uh, I think he would have been admired greatly simply for being successful. But I think there's an aspect in Australian culture which, uh, which loves to cut down the tall poppy and certainly Ken has, has, Ken Doan has be become, uh, as it were, a tall poppy because of his tremendous success in, in, a, in a number of related fields. The fact that um, some designs that I do or that come from the painting end up on material or swimwear or into, say, wide circulation, some people have some problems with this. Well, I don't. I mean, I think this is terrific. I see no reason why 
uh, things that people have in their everyday life shouldn't be well designed or shouldn't come from that particular source. And, mate, I'm not breaking any ground there. I mean, Matisse, Dufay did wonderful, wonderful fabric. Often, for instance, I might just pop in for a minute or so, they'll call me down, when we're at the point of discussing the size of a particular print. I would have done an original drawing, Moira would have simplified it, Judy and Moira then will be thinking about the size that it might be, or really the fabrication. So I keep involved in all of that, but really, just a word here or there. Lovely. Looking good. Have we done a wash test on that? Is that yeah. the shrinkage of it? Well, Judy's responsibility, of course, is in the area of, of all the fashion and all of the product, but it's actually more than that. I mean, Judy has to see ahead and have some kind of overview and some kind of vision of what a particular range will look like. So often she'll be instigating. She'll choose a piece or a colour and put that into her range. Just have this bikini top piloted so you can get an idea how it's going to look. Really cute, I think. Yeah. So I, I think to integrate Ken's art into fashion is quite complex. It's much more of a challenge where most designers would buy and have a choice of existing fabrics and prints um, to take the art and carry the feeling of it through to fabrics into garments is another whole part of the business that most other people don't have to work with. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's Grand Award recognizes two achievements that are vital for the future of Australian fashion, distinctive design and export excellence. Tonight's award goes to a very talented team a couple who believe we can create original designs in Australia and sell them to the world. They believe it because they are doing it. With a 50 million turnover, their company is successfully showing the world that Australia can achieve. Best of all, their work is inspired by the things that make Australia so special. The colour and beauty of the landscape and our easy-going lifestyle. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I announce the grand winner, Don Art and Design. We never really consider ourselves to be totally fashion people in that sense, because our business is a combination of a lot of things, and our success is due to a lot of other things. But we were thrilled to have that recognition, because in that part of the business, in the fashion part of the business, we've worked very hard in making it successful. Can, can see an opportunity. He's got a great vision. I don't know that he knows he's got this vision. Being so close to him, it really is hard to discuss it. I guess if you're sitting away, you can see that this guy's done amazing things, but it has taken a long time. He's got this fabulous ability be it an enormous ego or an enormous faith in himself, where he really believes in what he's doing and nothing will stop him. I thought it was the correct thing to do to open a gallery in the rocks. I mean, that's, I thought that was the most honest thing in a way that you said, well, here's the work and here's the place that you can go and see it and this is what it cost. Hi, Bridget. Oh, hi, Ken. These are some new Sydney Harbour drawings. We're going to make a silk screen edition out of one of them and probably just show the originals. And I'm going to go down and have a look at that new gallery, have a site meeting with them. OK. There's so much pretension in the art world, really, especially in dealers and their relationship to artists and stables and artists and all. Essentially, they're selling things. They're selling things. Art galleries should be called art shops. You go there to buy something, you know? And people sometimes are very pretentious about that kind of... Thing. So I try to cut a lot of that crap out. It's fantastic now after uh, 10 or 15 years to think that we're now about to open and move into uh, a proper I, gallery uh, space. Looks fabulous. Yes, looks fabulous. Let, let me see that for a little It's bit. a building that uh, the Rocks Authority has spent a lot of money and a lot of time preserving and I think that we have a responsibility not to change too much the character of the building. 
putting an art gallery into a building is in, in some ways uh, the least uh, offensive thing that you can do because really all we're doing is floating some beautiful white walls, putting in a lighting system, cleaning it all up. Yeah, so it's just beneath the girders. Yeah. And is there lighting going all the way along this wall? Yes, this beam's light and we'll sit the track about a metre. And almost inevitably a lot of the work should relate specifically to Sydney Harbour. I can't wait to see it finished and paintings on the walls. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> One of my oldest mates, uh, Dennis, has got a terrific boat and uh, often I, I go out with him just to look at the harbour from the water, from that point of view. What do you think? Looks fantastic. Well, it's such a great spot here because you, know, you can see the shape of the bridge, see the shape of the Opera House. I've certainly never tired of the Opera House and never tired of the bridge. To have a structure like that, besides something that's as aesthetically pleasing as the Opera House, we're, we're doubly blessed in a way, I think, to have those two icons so close together. Of course, some of the first things that people saw of mine were very simplistic drawings of the Opera House. Now, for as many of those kind of very loose drawings that I've done, I've needed to support those with very tight drawings. My, my work tends to float between very simple things that might have wide appeal and much more complex drawings, but essentially it's still the feeling of the Opera House, the feeling of the bridge and the absolute magic of Sydney Harbour. Ken paints his own environment his own view of the world, that means literally the view that he sees. The same is absolutely true of Van Gogh. Van Gogh spent his entire career giving you the view from his window. Ken's very similar. I first saw this little building when I was about 14, and I felt then that I never wanted to set foot in this space until I knew that I could paint in here, until I knew that it could be mine. And I always felt that this should be an artist studio and that a great deal of my life should be about painting uh, and showing to people what it's like to be in this space. I'm not the first artist to, uh, I suppose, do lots of work in a given space. I suppose it's because it's continually visually stimulating, whether it's the things that are in the cabin itself, whether it's the paint, whether it's the things that you see out the window. I keep painting them because I enjoy them, uh, and I paint them in slightly different kinds of ways. And I suppose the truth of the matter is, I like to be here. I like to be here. Ken actually projects um, a bon vivant uh, feel. And he, if, if, if you just know him as a student or as a, as a friend and so on, you might think that this person just has a love of life and, and has a good time. Um, but he's, in fact, dedicated to, to his various part of his artistic profession and he spends a, a tremendous amount of time working in the studio but that's that's him working in the studio so you don't see that that's a private Ken I really try when I approach a, a blank piece of canvas just to try and remember the original sensation that I had about the painting that I want to make and really let the adventure of making that particular painting lead me up into all kinds of tracks. And that's really the exciting thing about painting. It, it is a constant visual adventure. And I'm certainly not the kind of painter that uh, meticulously works out each square inch of the canvas and ticks away at it for ages. For me, it has to be an emotional thing. It has to come from somewhere inside your guts. You just have to feel it and put it down. Drawing is the bones of all painting, even the paintings that might look to some people to be quite loose or reasonably abstract have some kind of bones to hold them together and it's like the underlying a beat in a piece of music, the underlying composition, the underlying structure of a building. It has to be there uh, for you to build the painting on. I would be very flattered if I thought my work was as good as a five-year-old. That kind of simplicity that children have, it's very hard to find again. 
But um, if you've been at it for a while, then I think that, that you should be starting to develop some signs, some symbols, some way of working, some style, something that becomes recognisably yours. And I think it's a very shallow view for people to say, well, I could knock that out. I mean, I, I, in my life, I haven't yet found anybody that can. Uh, and sometimes, even if I want to make or I'm trying to make a very simplistic drawing, I might do it 20 or 30 times to get it, to get it right. I think it's just like saying, well, anybody can pick up a trumpet and blow a few notes. I think it's a bit more complex than that. Let's do one. Okay, James, here we go. I, I would hope that there's some similarities in my work to jazz. It's the same kind of thing. I mean, there are no new notes in the world. There are no new colours in the world. It's just a matter of really the relationship of them, how you play them. I think the single most important thing that Ken and I realised shortly after we met was that we both wanted to do the same thing with our art forms. He doesn't like people to have to be art critics to understand what he's doing. You can be, but the important thing is anyone can stand there and look at a Ken Doan painting or drawing and instantly feel what's going on and smile. <laughs> It doesn't surprise people when a musician uh, creates a composition because of something that's happened to him or because of a feeling. And I think Ken is very like a musician. He has an experience. It may be a visual one, but he feels... Uh, he always talking about feeling rhythms. I'd love to be a musician. If I come back again, i really like to be able to play something. I am very uh, envious of James's... not only his ability to play, but the, the instantaneous reaction that he gets from an audience. Painting is a very lonely business. It's a kind of second-hand business in a way, you know? All of the joy, or most of it, comes from within you, usually when you're on your own making the painting. has arrived very much at his own way of looking at things, his own way of putting things down on the canvas. And this is especially true, I think, of his underwater reef paintings. Ken has taken the underwater motive, the coral reef motive, and he has constantly explored it, its various facets, and he's gone back over it again and again and again. Uh, and this, again, I think, is, is, is another sign of his serious approach to his, his fine art. To drop off a boat onto a coral reef is just hypnotic. I think it's absolutely one of the most exciting things imaginable. The feeling of the coral or those little darting, flickering fish and the colours of the fish and the richness of the marine life, the constant discoveries that you find there, even if you're just hovering over a tiny little coral head or if you're dropping off the edge of a, of a really big uh, crevasse, is just wonderful. or the forces of nature or the things that nature makes, whether it be the things that grow or the things that are under the sea, are just, uh, I think, part of the absolute life force of the world. So the fact that as a painter I'm attracted to those kind of things, uh, I think that's quite natural. It's never as good as nature. I mean, you're always humbled. All you can do is try to convey some of the feeling of that some of the sensation of the way that you look at nature.
The sketches that I do when I'm here on Tomborua often are totally complete within themselves. I never, for instance, take a sketch and blow it up to size and try and recreate it again. I might refer to that piece of information, but rather it's really the, all the sketching and the drawing is something to put it into my head. Um, but each painting, each piece should be thought of as its own piece. If I'm going to do a big painting of the reef and it's going to be, say, two metres square, the scale of that particular work will dictate how I paint it, what kind of brush I use, how my hands work. It'll be a different kind of painting from one that might happen here. I've always liked islands. I mean, I've always had a thing about islands ever since I was a little boy, I suppose. And uh, we first came here, oh, maybe 15 years ago. I think there are just so many stimulating things on this island. I mean, apart from the fact it's got beautiful reef and it's wonderful to dive in. Spotted fern. Judy and I often, when we were walking around the island, might start to talk about various colour relationships that may trigger a creative thought or a whole process that might end up in a collection or one particular design. So while I might be formulating various images to be used in painting, she has to start to get into her mind a whole collection of clothes that may not be created for another 12 months or so. It's nice to work with French, um, pink French Japan. Yeah. What about a kari? That's a little... Oh, that's beautiful. Cool. And I think one of the things that really keep Judy and I very close together is we do have a very... Uh, similar visual attitude to things. She's better on detail than I am. Perfect for swimwear, those colours look so well. Village life I find very appealing. I mean, I like the Fijian people very much, and of course a lot of them now are my friends, or our friends, we've known them over a 10 or 15 year period. So we've seen the kids grow up and we've seen new houses built. But in a way, some of the nicest things, in fact, is that there isn't any change. That the welcome that you get, that that uh, genuine feeling that you find in a village like that, I think is really precious in this day and age. How much is this? Mm, it's beautiful. Beautiful. I love to have it. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a number of pieces of tarpa cloth that we've collected over the years. Some of them I've used in paintings themselves. Some of it I've used physically as the border for paintings. But graphically, tarpa cloth is very beautiful. <laughs> This kind of island environment, I suppose, you know, if you go back to the romance of Gauguin or Matisse when they visited tropical islands like this and you saw reflected in their work uh, the kind of images of islands, I just think it's an incredibly uh, romantic environment and a really rich visual environment. <laughs> You can't ever look at Gauguin's work without learning a lot about the kind of colour that you find in the tropics. You see intense reds, uh, unbelievably strong magentas. You see colours against colour. You see that kind of feeling. And also, I like sometimes that you'll see some colour, say, of a bure or of a hut that's been faded over time. I mean, the kind of blue that you can only find when that blue has been in intense sunlight for a long time. Ken appeals very directly to the senses. One does respond very directly to the large, fluid shapes in his paintings and also to the vivid, vivid, bright colours. Ken, I guess, is the first artist really to respond to that wild, fauve quality that I think is very Australian. And people overseas can see that. Ken doesn't see the Japanese tour groups as a commercial thing. I think he sees it as a truly human side to the business. The type of Japanese women that seem to come to the gallery on these tours are aged between 18 and 35, 
trendy, um, fairly affluent. Basically, they would all be honeymooners. They don't come in groups of females like you would see Westerners travelling. They do come with their new husbands. They're very shy. They laugh a lot, particularly when they see Ken. And he's just terrific with them. And if he's not too busy, he'll come out, which is most of the time. He does take, tend to take on far, far too much still in, in, in the broader sense, where he always says, I have to learn to say no. I must learn to say no more often. Because obviously Ken gets asked to do many, many things apart from our own business. Hi. Hi, Ken. How are you? Well, thanks. That's good. Would you mind if I introduce you to some of my clients? Sure. He's just so generous. And his ability to give to people is also quite staggering. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Nice to meet you. How do you do? How do you do? Pleased to meet you. How do you do? Would you like to take a picture? I think the reason that Ken's so popular with the Japanese, well, one of the reasons is that Hanako, the weekly magazine that comes out in Tokyo that's aimed at uh, young women between about 18 and 35, um, has a, one of his designs or paintings on its cover each week. And this has been happening now for over five years. So obviously the name Kendon in Japan, particularly in Tokyo, is huge. the Japanese. I've had lots of exhibitions in Japan. The last one, I think 200,000 people came to it to travel to six cities. And if I'm in, interviewed in Japan, well, let's say if I'm interviewed in Australia, in the past, the question used to be, uh, do you have a lot of money and do you live in a waterfront home? So that, that's what people seem to be more interested in. In Japan, I'm asked questions like, what is the feeling in your heart when you put those two blues together? In other words, there are questions of aesthetics about the work itself. Ken himself sees no hierarchy between his artwork and his design work. To him, it's all creative. It's all making beautiful things. Where the difference is, is where the audience is. Ken has always believed that each viewer is as important as any other viewer. Each person who appreciates an aesthetic object is as valuable, as important as any other person. There's not a, a hierarchy for him between a person who looks at a painting and a person who appreciates a beautiful design product. We don't just do art. Um, we do a whole uh, variety of products. And the Japanese, in fact, seem to be able to relate to that more than most other cultures particularly the Australian culture, where people do tend to want to pigeonhole you and say, you're an artist, you're a businessman, you make golf balls, you, therefore you can't make silk shirts and you can't make wonderful swimwear. And Japanese tend to accept us for just being, or accept Ken particularly, for being a very talented man who has interest across a number of fields. A lot of people still see artists as somehow being outside of society, but dead, preferably, starving, even better. Starving and dead, perfect. Uh, people see them in that kind of way. And I think that that's, again, I mean, surely that we, we've passed that particular myth. Art, the artist, should be part of society. Powerhouse Museum is interested in wealth generation. That may seem strange, but it is. We're interested in industry. These last few years have been recession years, and we've thought very hard about what it is that makes wealth for a country, for a, for a society. Well, Ken's a very successful businessman. So we would show him in the Powerhouse Museum for that alone. But he's also a very, very good artist. Oh, good day, mate. Good day. Uh, look, you might be interested in this. This is the first prototype of the plate. There's a lot of nonsense spoken about who's an artist and who's a designer who's decorative and who's really creative. Gauguin painted fans, and of course, Bonnard painted screens. 
decorative screens for the interior of a house, as did his friend Villard. And most French artists into the 20th century, most of the great ones, have worked as decorative artists. Picasso has. Picasso, of course, has decorated pots. But what's great is all these shapes, I know, are the kind of shapes you're going to have all over the walls, aren't they? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, right. I hope yeah. so. Yes, with the powerhouse restaurant, I mean, it's a wonderfully exciting job. Uh, originally, they wanted to know whether I would do some big murals on the wall. So I went and had a look at it and the, the fabulous walls, and, and, and I, I said, yes, I'd be pleased to, but if I'm going to do the things on the wall, then the plate should look a certain way, or the material should be a certain way, or the chair should be a certain way. So I took on the job so that I can do the totality of it all with a few friends to help me put it together. Look, the first thing I think that we've got to establish is that when, when you come into this room and you see this really long wall, with the, the stairs going around, I've really got to work out where the big shapes go, where this kind of flower shape goes. When I and, first um, saw the restaurant in the powerhouse, it was very grey and very drab and uh, not really a very inviting space. In fact, very complex piece of architecture. So it was terrific to see it all painted yeah, white. It really gave you a sense of the volume that you were working in. Yes, that's the feeling. You've got to have big lines to sweep people around, to take them around this kind of space here, you know? What, what I like to see now, I like to make some marks on the wall, see how it goes. Right. Come on, let's have a look at it. To me, there's always a real sense of almost trepidation, certainly heightened excitement, about making the first mark on the wall. I wanted to have the courage to just stand in front of it and make the marks and find the flow of the shapes and just let the paint uh, go onto the wall with a real freshness. If I'm starting in a new painting or a big mural that has the feeling of a frangipani or a morning glory or the shape of a leaf, even though I might be trying to simplify it, I hope that I'm still conveying or remembering uh, everything about that object and how it affected me when I first saw it. I wanted the paint always to be slightly thin. It's the whiteness underneath that makes the colour really glow. If you work any painting too much, it tends to be a bit dull. You need that kind of luminosity underneath. There was some amazing degrees of difficulty in this particular job, but to work in this case with the brush on the end of a very long pole, to be not even sure of what the feeling would be when the brush actually touched the surface. I mean, some people might say, well, that's kind of naive. You should, you know, practice and practice and practice before you do these things. But I don't want to work that way, and I don't want to paint that way, and I don't want this restaurant to to look in the end overworked. I wanted to always have the freshness of the feeling of a painting. People always say, well, you couldn't compare a Ken Dern with a Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. That would be crass. Well, of course it isn't crass. You can compare Ken because Ken is the popular painter of his day. He does have a right to sit there. Michelangelo didn't see himself as the greatest painter in the history of the world. Leonardo da Vinci didn't see himself that way, or Botticelli. They were journeymen. They were people who painted for a living and were painted for popular consumption. And Ken is a guy who paints for a living and paints for popular consumption. And the population like him exceedingly well. It's a valid position. I'm an old-fashioned person in a sense, and I believe in the, in the old idea of posterity. I think posterity sorts us all out in the end. It'll, so we'll probably have to wait for another 50-odd years for our uh, descendants to tell us where, where we all fit in. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if uh, Ken's work uh, stood the test of time. Uh, yeah, I think I'm getting better at painting. I mean, I've been painting now for, I don't know, um, 45, 50 years, I suppose. And I think I'm starting to get some uh, feeling of what I want it to be. In the end, a painter's life, you, it's always half finished. I mean, even if I live to 100, you're still only kind of halfway there or three quarters of a way there. It takes a lifetime, I think, to be good at it. But I, I feel now, certainly over the next few years, that uh, the things are starting to really go the way that I, I, I want them to go, that I have some real control over what I'm trying to do. And yet, 
Every time you start a picture, it's like an adventure. I mean, you really don't know where it's going.